going to set the stage here for the what would be the ultimate effect of introducing the emerging church into Adventism? The ultimate effect is overturning the Adventist pillars. That would be, that really is the, the message really in a nutshell. And so what we're going to do is we're going to trace, um, we're going to do a historical overview of the pillars and then trace how some of the crises within the Adventist church have affected the pillars all throughout um, the, uh, uh, our Adventist kind of life cycle. I'm indebted to, I'm, I'm basically almost plagiarizing this whole presentation um, yeah, from Dr. Fernando Canale. He's, uh, he's my advisor uh, in the dissertation, and uh, I happen to have the privilege of being a fly on the wall in what's called the Adventist Sola Scriptura Research Group, in which we are um, assessing uh, some of these things. And when I heard his presentation, I never thought about how the crises in the Adventist church affected the biblical pillars. What are the biblical pillars? And why are those pillars so important? And uh, how do they work within the greater framework of the 28 fundamental beliefs? And so I thought, this is, this, this is perfect. And so uh, while much of the information comes, you know, comes from him, it is still my understanding of his, of, of his position and... Uh, and so I'm sharing that with you. I probably don't need to inform you that there is, uh, that there is disunity. And while it's not always nice or pleasant to talk about uh, the negatives, I've learned that when my wife went into nursing, that, that if you can't make a correct diagnosis, you're not going to be able to help the patient. Uh, and so everything, everything depends upon a correct diagnosis. And if that, if that doesn't take place, then we don't know where to go from here. Uh, up, up uh, and up until that point. Elder Wilson, Elder Tel Tel Wilson in his 2013 State of the Church Address looked at four points uh, and as he was assessing the, the Worldwide Adventist Church he stated these four things. A loss of Seventh-day Adventist identity among some of our pastors and church members. Number two, the growing tide of worldliness in many of our churches. Number three, the danger of disunity and number four, a spiritual complacency and apathy that leads to a lack of involvement in the mission of the church. And that was basically his state of the, the church address back there in 2013. What I found to be um, very uh, helpful and, and, and correct was what he believed to be the cause of all those, those four points that I just mentioned up there. And so I'll just briefly read. It says, now here is precisely my concern. Too many of our pastors and members either have failed to recognize or have forgotten the divine prophetic calling God has given us as a church. There's a growing tendency to minimize our differences with other denominations. In some Seventh-day Adventist churches, the messages from the pulpit are little different than the typical Protestant church. Much of this, now here's, here's where he's laying out the cause. Much of this comes from the neutralization of the Bible as God's word. So if you just briefly go back here and look at the, the assessment of the, uh, of the patient and describe the condition of the patient, the cause here, according to Elder Wilson, is much of this comes from the neutralization of the Bible as God's word. It is so important that we base our beliefs on the Word of God using the historical biblical method of studying the scriptures and approaching prophetic understanding from the historicist perspective. God's Word must be foundational to our belief, faith, and practical living. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth if we will study, pray, and listen to God's voice. This will help us strongly establish our Seventh-day Adventist identity. All right? So he not only described the condition, but in his opinion, it was the neutralization of God's word. That is the ultimate cause for why this is happening. And so if you're going to lay the cause there, then that means the solution to the problem is that we must know God's word. Um, and we must know the importance of what these pillars are and and how they exercise an interpretive role. They are actually, for lack of a better way to, to put it, uh, you know, when you go get your eyes tested and, and, they're, and you're trying to read off of what's off the screen over there, um, if you can't, then they're going to change the lenses. The Adventist pillars, which we're going to uncover in just a moment, Ellen White's interpretation of those pillars, those are the eyeglasses. They're not just isolated doctrines. 
but they help form and shape our understanding of all the rest of the 28 fundamental beliefs, okay? They exercise that kind of a control. And, and I hope that maybe that can be made plain as we go through each crisis and how each crisis has affected those Adventist, those Adventist pillars. All right, so that's Elder Wilson's assessment and, and what he believes is the cause, which, which I agree with. Now, here's another administrator's assessment. I'm not going to give you the person's name. But um, it says, lately there have been a lot of voices talking about the many problems in the church. And the word problems is in, is in quotes. And not having really a greater context, it would lead me to believe that perhaps these are not really real problems. That there are problems in the minds of people, but they're not really real problems. Lately, there have been a lot of voices talking about the many problems within the church. Things like the style of worship, who is called to ministry, the education that our pastors receive at our institutions of higher learning, even simple things like the outreach methods that are undertaken. Today, many of our members are quick to judge others, condemning them as heretics for what they believe or teach. Voices are quick to proclaim that their way of reading the Bible is better, that they are the true Adventists. And he goes on, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the head of our church, then we need to let him lead. We need to stop our talking, stop trying to run the church our way, and just pray for his leading. This is the only way we will survive as a church family. It is the only way to discuss our differences. We must also accept each other for who we are, not for what we aren't. If we believe that all are called to be servants of Jesus Christ, then we must trust him to let uh, trust him to lead in our lives. So the one, the one cause is the neutralization of the Bible. The other cause, and again, there's, there could be a lack of context here. Uh, the other cause seems to be, let's just pray um, and let's stop criticizing. Now, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of things in these statements that I, that, that I, sh that I absolutely agree with. Uh, am I suggesting that prayer is not important? Of course not. It is incredibly important. But, um, but to, to, to function the way we are without assessing what those differences are, assessing their relationship with the sola scriptura principle in the Bible, assessing their relationship with the pillars of the church, if we ignore all that, ignore a critical Bible study, obviously to shape us and to make sure that we're converted, I like what the pastor was, was saying, it's soul searching, and then soul saving, you gotta, have, you gotta have the two. But if we neglect the critical aspect of Bible study, if we neglect what those pillars are, if we neglect how they shape the rest of the church and what Adventism is or what should be, and we just decide to pray, we will solve nothing. In my opinion, we'll solve nothing. And so this is kind of more like a, you know, a spiritualized approach. And so the cause of division here is just lack of prayer and, and, and Christ. Now, now yeah, if, if, if Christ meant, you know, a deep study of God's word, then I think, you know, there would be much agreement. But it doesn't seem to be within the context of the statement. And uh, statements like this is the only way a church will survive as a, or we will survive as a church family. And there's nothing within the context of that statement to, to say that critical Bible study is important as we think about these so-called problems then... I think you have two different assessments uh, to, the, to, to what's happening. So the goal of this presentation, to identify the biblical Adventist pillars, to take a brief overview of various crises in the, in the history of Adventism, uh, and to see how each crisis affects the pillars, and to see how the emerging church also affects the pillars. All right? So that's, that's the goal of the presentation here. And so we're going to take a look at the conditions of method in early Adventism. 1950 to 19, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that should be 1850 to 1888, discovering the vision, the pillars. Okay. Now, um, I remember reading the book, The Great Controversy, for the first time and being introduced to those pillars. I didn't recognize them as pillars and how important and formative they were in the shaping of Adventism. That has come, you know, for me just, just really, really recently. But um, it, was, it was intense Bible study. It was the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation that led to the discovery of the heavenly sanctuary. That was basically how the church began. 
for many of us, Sabbath, uh, Sabbath keeping is non-negotiable. The, immor- the non-immortality of the soul is non-negotiable. Clean and unclean is non-negotiable. We're not going to negotiate on any of those things. Why didn't God begin with some? Why didn't God begin there? He's trying to establish a movement. Why did He not begin there? And this speaks to the formative, the formative aspect, the the uh, the interpretive power of the sanctuary message. The sanctuary is not just one of those doctrines, you know, if, you, if, if, if I was talking about a mosaic, you know, where you have all these little different colored dots and, and then you have a nice little picture. The sanctuary is not just a little detail. It's not just a little mosaic or, or, or a piece of, a, you know, a piece of the rock there that's colored blue. That's, if that's what you think the sanctuary is, or some of the rest of the pillars are, then it's entirely understandable why we're going the route of the emerging church. Some of us are. It's entirely understandable at that point. And so in the, in, in the Sabbath conferences of 1848, we, we, we hammered out, for lack of a better word, the system. We hammered out the system. Through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, we were led to see what Christ was doing in that heavenly sanctuary. We began to interpret who who Christ was within the context of that sanctuary. And when that sanctuary was opened, we saw a complete system, as Ellen White says, connected and harmonious. Let me just share with you kind of another metaphor uh, just to help us to understand the interpretive role of of the sanctuary. and oh, I so appreciate my, my ladies, my wife and, and Sophia singing. Uh, they really make me look good. So <laughs> uh, thank you to them. But let's, let's imagine here I had Beethoven's Fifth Symphony right here. I know it's my Bible, but uh, let's imagine we have Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. All right, and here's all the notes. Okay. All right, now how many of you could just look at that? Let's say you never heard of Beethoven's Fifth. How many of you could just look at that and the music sounds off in your head? All right. You don't have to raise your hands, but I think you're getting the point. All right. Now, you got a whole bunch of data here, okay? But that data needs to be processed. Now, let's say if we pick for a processor the ukulele. So you got Beethoven's fifth, you know, massive symphony, lots of notes. And then you pick a ukulele. For the benefit of those who don't know what a ukulele is, I will explain. Uh, it's got four strings. It's a lot smaller than a guitar. <laughs> it looks like a guitar. All right. Now, you got, you got lots of notes here. How many different sounds does a ukulele make? Just one. But you got, the data suggests that you need all different types of sounds. But you only got one kind of sound. The data suggests that the chords are much more complex than what a ukulele can produce. Four. And so what's going to happen? You're going to lose a lot of your data. Not only are you going to lose it, you're going to misinterpret it. What if you go to the piano next? Well, the piano only has one kind of sound, but the data is calling for more than one kind of sound. You're moving in the right direction because the big block chords of the piano can capture a little better the complexities of Beethoven's fifth. But I was in Chicago last week, and so if you have the the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, 120-piece orchestra, you have the right system. Now, not one note will be lost. It will all be correctly interpreted also. This is the function of the heavenly sanctuary. This is the function of the sanctuary, all right? It has a controlling, interpretive influence over over all this. And if you reject it like the early church did, you've got Greek philosophy. And it will then come in and reinterpret everything else. And so what the pioneers did in the beginning was extremely revolutionary. I'm talking about from a philosophical level. Okay? From a philosophical level, what our pioneers did was extremely revolutionary when it comes to Christianity. Adventism is not just another church on the block that, you know, we all believe in all these eternal verities, which I'll get to pretty soon, and then we add on top of that the Sabbath and the sanctuary and all that, and, you know, we all live happily ever after. That's not what happened, and that's not what really we're about. Okay. So that's how the church began. They saw the beauty of the system, And they said, all right, this is how we're supposed to operate. 
But just 40 years later, um, I want you to notice what's taking place here. This is just a generation, 1889. The passing of time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our understanding the eyes, uh, 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 opening to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in in, in heaven. So that's number one. And having decided uh, relation to God's people upon the earth. If you believe in Plato, then there is no relationship between the heavenly sanctuary and what we're doing here on earth, okay? None whatsoever. Um, And I wish I could take you through more philosophy 101 to explain to you the revolutionary nature of that statement, okay? Because Catholicism doesn't believe that. There There is an essential gap between heaven and God and earth, okay? Here, she's saying there's a relationship, a reciprocal relationship between what Christ does up there and what's supposed to happen down here. Number two, first and second angel and third angel's message unfurling the banner on which was uh, inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks uh, under this message was the temple of God seen by his truth-loving people in heaven and the ark uh, containing the law of God. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. Um, Let's see. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the the heading of the old landmarks. All this cry about changing the old landmarks is all imaginary. Now, this is in the context of righteousness by faith in 1888 when Jones and Wagner came in, and they they started talking about righteousness by faith, and the old guard was saying, you're changing the landmarks. And she's saying, no, they're not, okay? So her uh, understanding of, of, of the pillars of Adventism constitute the sanctuary, the three angels' messages, the law, the Sabbath, the non-immortality of the soul. This is like the mirror image of what philosophy has as its pillars, okay? The philosophical pillars are the timelessness of God. That knocks out the sanctuary, that knocks out the Sabbath, Another philosophical pillar is the immortality of the soul, which, again, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man form the, uh, the, the most basic of all presuppositions and are incredibly important to understand everything else. So when, when, when she's talking about these pillars, this is a revolutionary new interpretation of God and of the world and of how we ought to relate with one another. Okay, this is like, this is radically new. Those are the pillars that she identified, all right? And they exercise a hermeneutical control. I I alluded to this statement, Great Controversy 423. It says, the subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his people. That's the, that is the role that it, that it plays. She also said this, as a people we are to stand firm on the platform of eternal truth that has withstood the test and trial. We are to hold to the sure pillars of our faith. The principles of truth that God has revealed to us are our only true foundation. They have made us what we are. The lapse of time has not lessened their values. So these pillars actually give us our identity. Without that, we can call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists, but we're not. This is what gives us our identity. And when that is gone, then our mission is gone. Our educational institutions are gone. Everything is gone. And just, these are just some other statements. And so kind of like a pictorial here, you have the sola, tota, and prima scriptura principles. Okay. The Bible is the sole the, the sol authority. When compared to all other forms of literature and the deductions of science, we go with the authority of what the Bible has to say. Um, the entire Bible, that's tota. That's, that's contra Luther, who kind of had a canon within a canon. And then scripture first. So there you have the Sabbath, the law, the sanctuary, the non-immortality of the soul, the three angels' messages that are derived from a comprehensive study of the sola tota and prima scriptura principles. And then that leads to a system of truth connected and harmonious, and then the church and her mission. So the church and her mission assumes all of this stuff down here. 
That's what it assumes. So when the emerging church comes along and starts changing stuff here when it comes to worship and, and, and different forms of prayer, what you, what you ought to be thinking about is, well, how does it affect all this stuff? Is there a dichotomy between how I, how I do spirituality, how I do worship, and then the pillars? Are they non-causally related? Can I do things any way, that, any way that I want to and have them not affect the pillars? That's the question that we need to ask. All right. Now, causes leading to the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The disappointment plus a, a, a critical Bible study Sola Toda scripture, uh, Sola Toda and Prima Scripture uh, principles led to the pillars of Adventism. That led to a complete and harmonious system of theology and philosophy. That led to the mission to share the pillars and the system. That led to the foundation and organization of the church. Amen. That's how it operated, both logically, philosophically, and chronologically. All right, so now we go to the conditions of meth. So now that you know what the pillars are, all right, five of them, Sabbath, non-immortality of the soul, the sanctuary, the three angels' messages, and uh, what am I forgetting? The perpetuity of the law. Thank you. Those are the pillars. The, that's what she identified as the pillars. Those are your eyeglasses. Those are your Chicago 120-piece orchestra for analyzing the data, all right? And that's how we are to work in trying to solve some of these theological problems. All right, so now we'll kind of take a, a historical overview in Adventism of some of the major crises that have occurred and how they related to the pillars, okay? And uh, here, uh, this crisis in 1888 actually neglected the vision of the pillars. And so tradition comes into Adventism via, those are Ellen White's words, a most wonderful laziness, okay? So you have the contribution of Minneapolis, and, and this is according to historians and preachers and, the, uh, and, and, and some official and traditional interpretations. Um, the problem, you have the law in Galatians as a background. They were arguing about Galatians 3.24 and what that meant. And you have this whole idea of justification by works versus justification by faith. Um, the contribution of Minneapolis, you have justification by faith as presented by Jones and Wagner and, 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 El, and Ellen White that ultimately won the day. Um, and, and so uh, it, later on, it, down there on the bottom, the 1888 movement, we must accept their theology and the latter rain will come or we must embrace the evangelical doctrine of justification by faith discovered by Luther. That's the message of Minneapolis. Okay, according to some. All right, and I'm not getting, that, that's a whole, you know, that's a whole study in itself. And um, in my effort to kind of combine it, I know I probably made historical errors, and so uh, that isn't the point here, as you're as you're going to as you're going to see. Um, Ellen White to Minneapolis delegates, August fifteenth, eighteen eighty eight. She says, "It has been shown me that there are many of our ministers who take things for granted and know not for themselves by close critical study of the Scriptures whether they are believing truth or error." If there was much less preaching by some and far more time spent upon their knees before God, pleading for him to open their understanding to the truth of his word, that they might have a knowledge for themselves, that their feet were standing on solid, uh, on solid rock, angels of God would be around them to help them in their endeavors. Praise God for that. Then she says, there's a most wonderful laziness that is indulged by a large class of our ministers who are willing others should search the scriptures for them and they take the truth from their lips as a positive fact but they do not know it to be Bible truth through their own individual research and by the deep convictions of the Spirit of God upon upon their hearts and minds that's the 1888 materials okay so she wrote extensively um, on Minneapolis in the years after the conference and so you have again the, the, the law issue in Galatians justification by faith um, on top of that, there's a spiritual division and the spirit of the enemy is present as well. So not only do you have a, you know, a theological issue, but the attitudes and all that were also wrong as well. And here the cause is second gener the, the second generation of Adventist leaders embraced Adventism culturally, but not by personal experience. The solution, critical personal Bible study. That's Ellen White's assessment as far as what happened in 1888. 
uh, Bible study first for personal conversion because we need it, and then to solve the doctrinal issues later. Now, notice, notice how she kind of sums this up as righteousness by faith related to the pillars and the opposition that was taking place. This is, the, this, is on, this is the book, Counsel to Writers and Editors, page 30. In Minneapolis, God gave precious gems of truth to his people in new settings. This light from heaven by some was rejected with all the stubbornness of the, Jew, the, the Jews manifested in rejecting Christ. And there was much talk about standing by the old landmarks. But there was evidence they knew not what the old landmarks were. There was evidence and there was reasoning from the word that commended itself to the conscience, but the minds of men were fixed, sealed against the entrance of light because they had decided it was a dangerous error removing, in quotes, the old landmarks. When, when it was not moving a peg of the old landmarks, but they had perverted ideas of what constituted the old landmarks. That is the point. So just a few years later, just 40 years later, I mean, 40 years earlier, yeah, we know what the landmarks are. Boom, 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 boom. 40 years later, in the context of this crisis on, on righteousness by faith, hey, hey, no, 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 we can't move in that direction. It's going to overturn the landmarks. She's like, look, you don't even know what the old landmarks are. And if that was possible back then, how many of us really know why the landmarks she pointed out are really landmarks as opposed to something else that you might think is a landmark. And if that could happen back then, it surely can happen today. So the pillars were not changed. They were just neglected. Justification by faith, righteousness by faith is not a pillar because righteousness by faith assumes the nature of God, the actions of God, the fact that we don't have a timeless immortal soul, those are the presuppositions of justification by faith. So justification by faith, as important as what it is, is not a pillar. So the new generation of leaders didn't know what the pillars were. And that's why she says there was a wonderful laziness of Bible students among the leadership and, and the people. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone is lazy. Um, but the laziness comes into discerning, I think, what the pillars are and how they relate to everything that has been taking place. So the first generation neglected to pass the pillars and their hermeneutical function to the second. And this was the cause of the division. And this was the cause of the lack of unity. No, no, the pillars, the pillars, the pillars. They didn't want the pillars were. If they could reason from the pillars, perhaps, and be converted, of course, and, and have the light enter in, then it might not have been a problem. And so this has kind of happened all throughout our our history. And, you know, I mean, I, I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, what, in, in, the early, in the early 1990s, like through reading, like, the Great Controversy. And I, I realized implicitly that there was something different <laughs> about Adventism, something radically different, that it wasn't just something, you know, another church on the block, that this, 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 this was radically different from the ground up. But Genera generation after generation, we, come, we become cultural Adventists. We just, we go to church on Sabbaths, you know, we eat the veggie links and so forth and so on, and uh, we've kind of lost, <laughs> we, we, we've, we lost our identity. All right. Moving on to another issue, uh, the conditions of method in the pantheistic controversy. The Adventist vision here, almost entirely replaced. We're talking about uh, 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 Kellogg here. Okay, replacing the pillars, pantheism's macro hermeneutical shift. Okay, macro hermeneutical shift is here's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. We used to have the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Now you just changed it to the ukulele. You following? That's, that, that's what that means. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Selected Messages, Volume 1, 204. Were this reformation to take place, what would be the result? 
the principles of truth that God and his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Okay? Now, you may not discern it, but that's what the emerging church does. It introduces an intellectual philosophy within the church that, if accepted, would completely nullify the pillars. Completely. All right? So a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of, of, of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which, without God, is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 204. So, so the pillars are going to be discarded because they're considered to be an error, and new pillars introduced, a system of intellectual philosophy. Okay, that's, that's what would take place. The Bible will be replaced by human tradition, building on the sand. Our religion will change, our Adventist lifestyle, our worship, our mission. New organizations, new books, new teachings, doctrines, wonderful work, social gospel in the cities. The Sabbath and, and, and God the Creator would be lightly regarded. God interpreted. Reinterpreted, I should say. So you would have ethical doctrine, no power. So if Kellogg had succeeded and Ellen White did not come in, then the pillars would be completely obliterated. Because in pantheism... Um, God is, or panentheism, the difference between panthe pan, uh, pantheism and panentheism, in pantheism, there's no distinction between God and anything else, anything and everything is God. But in panentheism, there are distinctions, okay? So not everything is God, but all is included in God, all right? Um, little technical, but uh, there's a pictorial. So if... If Kellogg's ideas were, were, uh, were accepted, this down here used to be the sola tota prima scriptura principle. Uh, that is our source for doing theology, the sola scriptura principle. That would be immediately replaced by tradition, philosophy, science, and culture. That's a fundamental change. You know, in Great Controversy 595, she says that the Bible is really our sole authority. Not the Bible plus culture, not the Bible plus tradition, not the Bible plus philosophy, the Bible. Here, it's tradition, philosophy, science, culture. You can even put the Bible in there, okay? Different sources of authority. Now, that leads to this whole idea of God and the world. So, in panentheism, the world is in God as God. So, here's God out there. The world is in him it's basically natural history, the evolutionary process. There's no God. It's not like you pray and God does something. No. It's not like you pray and something miraculous happens. No, no, no. That's, that's, not, that's not this God here, okay? As history seems to move along without any divine intervention, that's the history of God. He is so intertwined within nature, within matter, within history that he cannot break out of it. And he actually uh, evolves as history evolves. I know this sounds completely crazy, okay? <laughs> so, and it is <laughs> completely crazy. But what I'm seeking to do, and, and it's not like you're going to be, you know, these things are not going to jump out at you as, you as you read some of their materials at times. And so I'm being very intentional in getting to pulling the curtain aside and saying, here's what's on the bottom, fellas, okay? This is what's on the bottom. Do you think we can put SDA and stamp SDA on that and that will make it okay? Or have we just completely altered our identity? So, yes, if, if, if Kellogg would have succeeded, that would have been it. We would have been done. Uh, we, 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 we would not be here without Ellen White's intervention in that. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at another very controversial thing that happened in 1957, the book Questions on Doctrine. All right, now, I, I, 
you're going to have various opinions about that. And, I, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask you to suspend that for a moment. Because we are looking at this from, I can assure you, from a viewpoint that you have not thought of. And that's why I, I, I am not taking credit for this presentation. This is, uh, this is Dr. Canale uh, at, the, at the seminary, retired, all right? Um, practically almost one of the only philosophers in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, and so, okay, so what happened in Questions on Doctrine in 1957? Okay, the Adventist vi vision begins to, to, to fade. All right, so he has a little bit of history here. The pillars from 1905 to 1957. During that time, Ellen White's authority and role reached its highest level in the denomination, even to the point of replacing scripture and the practice of ministry, probably due to her decisive role aborting the panentheistic takeover of the church. Officially, the pillars of the formative pioneers remained unmodified, but a dissonance began to permeate Adventism. Officially, the traditional pillars were affirmed, but in practice, the evangelical interpretation of justification by faith was slowly emerging as the sole pillar of Adventism. Now, there is a big difference between Luther and Calvin's understanding of justification by faith and what Jones and Wagner were doing, okay? Completely different. With Luther and Calvin, they based their understanding of justification by faith off of predestination, which came from Plato, all right? And which basically meant that um, by faith for them meant not a mental assent on your part to understand or to believe. No. There is no cooperation in the, Lutheran, uh, in the Lutheran conception of justification by faith. God does everything. He believes for you, okay? That's kind of how it works. So what Jones and Wagner were presenting was not coming from that perspective. But here, the professor is saying that this pillar was slowly emerging during this time, all right? Now, now this is his, this is his title, Adventist's Addiction to Evangelicalism, all right? Why? Because we are under the assumption that the evangelicals go by the sola scriptura principle. And if you were in the previous presentation, now, now please don't misunderstand me and, and, and say that I'm not appreciating what Luther and all those guys did, okay? Uh, yeah, don't, don't go there. I, I just have to condense it and give you, I only got four presentations, <laughs> and so I have to kind of tell you the bad news at, at this point, okay? And uh, I mean, uh, Luther did some, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could have the temperament of a Luther. I mean, I just, you know, bombs are going off. And he's like, no, I'm going straight. And I'm, I'm going straight to the diet of worms. And I'm, Melanchthon is falling to pieces. And he's like, you know, I wish you just wouldn't do that. Yeah, if the cause is unjust, abandon it. I mean, you know, what a man. <laughs> and he, he, he introduced something, you know, the liberty of conscience thing. And yes, that uh, our standing with God does not depend on all these, these works, of course. But when you, when you peel that back, unfortunately, um, they were still borrowing from Greek thinking and their conceptions of predestination and justification by faith and all of that stuff. So, so if you have the idea that, you know, that, 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 that Protestantism goes by the sola scriptura principle, please, uh, you need to just really consider that. Uh, they do not. On the most fundamental of levels, they depart completely from that principle when they understand that God is timeless, that he doesn't do things in sequence, and that you have an, immort and that you have an immortal soul. Where, do you, I mean, where is that coming from? The two basic presuppositions that will color just about every doctrine in the Bible, and how you experience salvation, how you worship, and so forth and so on, at that level, they have departed. And so the problem is we go to Willow Creek, we go to all these other places so that they can teach us how to do worship and all that, and we're thinking, hey, as long as the 28 fundamental beliefs are in place, nothing's going to go wrong. And so in the 1950s, you have these evangelicals knocking on our door. And Walter Martin is wanting to produce a book on the, on the cults. And to his credit, at least he decides to ask us what we believe. <laughs> oh, I mean, hey, let me, you know, before I write this scathing, you know, book, let me just find out what we believe. And uh, I'm in agreement with Dr. Douglas's assessment that although Froome might have been a towering giant when it came to prophetic interpretation, he was an actual novice when it came to systematic theology. Those are completely two different disciplines. Um, 
And it, and it takes quite a lot for an individual to be knowledgeable in one and in the other at the same time, okay? Uh, and so, you have three lists of doctrines at the beginning of questions on doctrine. So, in common with all Christians, we have God, the Trinity, and salvation. In common with some Christians, we have the immortality of, uh, or non-immortality of the soul, tithing, prophetic interpretation. Now you have the Adventist distinctive doctrines. The sanctuary, the three angels' message, the gift of prophecy to Ellen White. Do you see what's happened there? You might miss it. <laughs> the, the Chicago 120-piece orchestra has just been replaced. It's just been relegated to a distinctive. That's just, that's, that what, that's what happened in 1957, okay? Sure, they were arguing about the nature of Christ. They were arguing about, you know, uh, salvation issues and all that. But when you peel it back, this is what happened. This is what happened. Adventists hold in common with evangelicals at least the, they call them the eternal verities or the way of salvation and justification by faith. The sanctuary and the three angels' messages lost their role as conditions of method. They merely became the identifying marks of our particular denomination. That's all. That's all they became. So basically, on a fundamental level, we were agreeing with the Calvinists here because that's who they were, all right? They were Calvinists. They were predestinarian. But the interpretation of predestination from them came from Plato. It didn't come from the Bible. That may be news to you, but that's the way it is. That's reality, okay? And that's why Dr. Douglas could say they were not prepared. So don't get into a debate about, uh, about M.L. Andreas and versus the rest of the guys, okay? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going there. And, uh, and I'm indebted again to Dr. Canale for bringing this insight out. So the 120-piece orchestra just got replaced, okay? The sanctuary just left. It was no longer... It was no longer the sanctuary and the Sabbath and the pillars to try to process through these issues with the evangelicals. That, that just became a distinctive now. That's what happened. And that's why it was so dangerous and, it's, and the tension is still with us to this day. Okay, something else that the professor brings into focus here. Um, the conditions of method divided, church unity broken, the quantum leap, Adventist universities in the 1960s to 1980, an intellectual crisis. So, how did we do theology before? We did it amongst ourselves. It wasn't done, you know, we, did, we didn't come up with the pillars by going to the, the universities out there. Okay? But when you have to offer doctoral degrees, what institution are you going to go to in order to get one? And so here you have, um, you know, theology moves from the church to the university. And when theology moved from the church to the university, and we're not talking about Adventist universities because we weren't offering doctoral degrees at this time. So when you're talking about moving from the church to the university, this is a quantum leap, okay? This is, this is, this is huge. This is an entirely new playground to play with and, an, and a playground that as we look back on now, we were completely unprepared for completely unprepared for. So now we got, you know, 120 universities, colleges around the world, so you have a university explosion, and uh, you're looking at all the universities up there. Okay. The, the, the problem was that the close critical Bible study and the wasn't happening. Well, let me just back up this way. If you were to go to, let's say you needed a systematic theology degree in the 1960s or 70s, well, you can't go to Adventism because you're going to go outside. But everyone that studies systematic theology and historical theology realizes that it's absolutely influenced and dominated by philosophy. So we decided we're not going to go that route. Okay? So we're going to concentrate on biblical studies, which is the Greek and the Hebrew and all that. So that's the route that we went. And over time... Our approach has exposed the limitations of that when it comes to a knowledge of the pillars, okay? I'm not trying to pit, uh, like Dr. Sorke, <laughs> we're, we're in different disciplines, so I'm not pitting his discipline against mine at this point. Uh, but it's realizing the limitations that both disciplines have. Like, uh, like in, in the biblical studies discipline, the way it's being done at the universities, you can't compare Scripture with Scripture. 
You know, when we had this whole thing with the Ford crisis later on, this, oh, no, you can't compare Daniel 8, 14 with Leviticus chapter 16. It's not, you know, it's not possible. Well, yeah, with those methods, you can't do it. But there are other methods. And so we entered into a completely new arena. 1967, the Adventist forums. This is basically the beginnings of Spectrum, Spectrum magazine. Um, and Spectrum ent entered into this whole thing uncritically, okay? Uncritically. Okay, so when we started moving into the direction of the universities, we began to assume what's called higher criticism uh, through SDA, you know. Higher critic the assumption of higher criticism is basically this. Um, the, the Enlightenment thinker, Immanuel Kant, Enlightenment thinker par excellence, in his epistemology, in his theory of knowledge, basically stated that the only things we can know are things in time and space. And so according to Kant and all the rest, because God is timeless and the soul is timeless and outside of time and space, we can't know them. So we can only know things in time and space. That means there's no interaction from God to the prophet. That means this is just simply a human book, all right? There is not one shred in this book coming from God. It is all a human production according to higher criticism, all right? So, I mean, we go to these universities and everyone, of course, is a higher critic. And we are completely unprepared for understanding the presuppositions of higher criticism, how they work, how they relate with the pillars of the church. I mean, it was just like we, we completely got hoodwinked on that. And so it's very difficult to process. If you, haven't, if you haven't gone through this before, I tell you what, I thought my professor was crazy, okay? We don't have a theology on this. We don't have a theology on that. We don't, what are you talking about? Look at all the stuff we've written. Only when I began to understand philosophy and how it worked, I said, you know what? He's crazy, but he's right. I can't believe it. Absolutely right. So here's the official view of the historical critical, uh, the, the church's official view. In other words, the church condemns it. Okay, the church condemns higher criticism. And some want to use a modified version of it. And it's like, that, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to use a modified version of higher criticism. Um, okay. Because it's a complete elimination of the sola tota prima scriptura principles, and also the concept of God that is based on higher criticism is the evolutionary concept of God. Okay. That's... And so why you would want to use a modified version of it, you want to use a modified version of something that claims that there's no action between God and the prophet, therefore it's a completely human book, and now you want to use a modified version of that. And so, it was condemned. But what actually happens in the church today? In the actual life of the church, there, there are some that condemn it and some that accept it. So it hasn't really gone away. Um, okay, then you have the evangelical turn with Desmond Ford. The background is sinless perfection. You have justification by faith from Protestantism is brought into the Adventist church and identified with the biblical positions. Desmond Ford denies the sanctuary and replaces it with the Lutheran interpretation of justification by faith. At least he was thinking, okay, how does, this, how does justification by faith relate to the sanctuary? Well, since he went the Platonic route through predestination and, th and through Luther, he saw a contradiction between that and the sanctuary, and he threw the sanctuary out. Okay. He basically threw it out. So, hey, nothing happened in 1844. Okay. And that's, that's what basically he's saying in this, statement, in this statement here. All the Old Testament types, he claims, pointed to Calvary. All right. Um, again, uh, if you accept the Lutheran interpretation of justification by faith, yes, you might as well just knock the heavenly sanctuary out. It has no use and no purpose whatsoever. Because w the, the assumptions that are made underneath are in complete contradiction to the, the Adventist biblical pillars, all right? Okay, and so yes, Ford's view today is, is condemned and embraced uh, all over the place. So if we accept Ford's view, there go the pillars, and the pillars are actually replaced by the gospel, okay? But the gospel is not interpreted based on the Bible. It's, ba it, it's interpreted on the, on the Bible and philosophy and so forth and so on. That's the only way you can get to the Lutheran interpretation of justification by faith. Then you have an evangelical system of theology and the church and her mission. So if you accept Ford's interpretation of the gospel, it is not coming from scripture, and then that affects the entire, the entire vision. Okay. Then you have postmodernism that, you know, that, comes, that comes along. 
and you have um, Adventist thinkers like Fritz Guy, who's basically now basically coming out and saying that um, uh, the sola scriptura principle uh, is out, and basically there is there are three poles: the Christian gospel, which of course he would interpret the Lutheran way, which is our spiritual center, our cultural context where we live, worship, and serve, and our Adventist heritage. So the Bible and the Bible and only has been replaced by the gospel our cultural heritage, and how we live, worship, and witness. So you just knocked out the Bible and the Bible only at that. Tradition replaces sola scriptura. And postmodernity, again, is condemned and embraced. Uh, the faith science conferences, yeah, it was condemned. Uh, the, the beefing up of, of, uh, of, of, of creation language in, in Fundamental Beliefs 6, yeah, postmodernity is condemned, but La Sierra, other universities, it's embraced. So this is, these things are actually functioning at the same time in the Adventist church. And if you accept the cultural turn, instead of the Bible and the Bible only, you have the gospel, cultural context, Adventist heritage, philosophy, science, culture, tradition, all on the bottom here. You have panentheism here. And then you have a system of intellectual philosophy, science, and culture, and the church in her mission, okay? This is just completely obliterating the pillars. Um, Steve Daly's Adventism for a New Generation. Basically, he's, basically he's saying um, uh, we, we need to embrace the gospel. That's basically what he's saying. And we need to look at Jesus as the all-encompassing figure. Jesus all. Um, Christians and all who acknowledge the lordship of Christ outside Christianity to a common core. This core is Jesus, the one who transcends all man-made religions and whose kingdom must be elevated above all denominational distinction. So Jesus is in, denominal, denominational distinction is out. That's basically what he's saying. And um, he says, we can cease to think of our, and speak for, uh, of ourselves as the remnant church and see ourselves as part of God's larger remnant. You see, that fits very well within an evolutionary framework where God is working with everyone and everyone is part of God's family and part of God's children and there's no remnant, there's no Babylon, there's no, you just knocked out the three angels' messages at that point. It's, it's done, it's gone. And that's just further evidence there. You have, the, you, you have the one project, the one emerging church, okay? Um... According to Alex Bryan here, the supreme challenge is whether or not we will hold a collective belief in a very big Jesus Christ uh, whose life argues for the existence and activity of a powerful and good God. The big issue is whether we want to worship a small Jesus or a large Jesus. And, uh, you know, he, he's not talking about the size of your faith here. He's talking about the fact that we all coexist together. That's what's really happening. All right. And not only that, there's kind of like a reinterpretation of what happened in the 1840s as well. Uh, he's claiming that primal, original, foundational Adventism was all about a desire to be with Jesus, of course. The founders, including Ellen White, had a deep emotional connection to Jesus. Okay, just a deep emotional connection. Not a cognitive connection, not a theoretical connection, not a formative connection, just an emotional connection. Well, yeah, that harmonizes very well with the aspect of the emerging church. All right, uh, and then he, he calls it a generous ecclesiology, uh, which is a doctrine of the church. And if you've read Brian McLaren's book, he calls it a generous orthodoxy. And so basically, again, um, this, is, this is moving towards an idea of the church that, that everyone can be a part of. There are no denominational uh, distinctions Jesus is in, and that, that is it. And so no Babylon, no, come out, no coming out of Babylon, that is completely neutralized. That's exactly what will happen to the pillars. The pillars will be replaced by Christ. Understood, not through the sanctuary, not through the Adventist pillars, but Christ will be understood through the multiplicity of sources here. And that's basically what happens. Okay, let me just quickly wrap, wrap this up. All right. So we looked at several uh, incidents in Adventist history, and we were basically asking, how does this relate to the pillars? How does it relate to the pillars? And th the more you get towards the emerging church, um, the more devastating the attack is on the pillars. And you basically have four, four traditions within Adventism operating at this time. You have biblical Adventism, evangelical Adventism, historic Adventism, and then cultural Adventism 
all operating within the umbrella of the church at the same time. But thankfully, some of us are waking up. We are waking up to the situation, like what's happening in some of the other universities, with the spiritual disciplines, with, the edu uh, with, with, with these conferences, with the One Project that's seeking to, with, if you're not familiar with it, to me, the, what the One Project needs to do is make a decision and distance themselves from the emerging church philosophically, okay? And so if you think I'm being critical and harsh, then the appeal is to make themselves, distinguish themselves from the emerging church. If not, at, 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 at best case scenario, they're closely associated. I mean, they're closely associated. They, they have done nothing to debunk the panentheism, the God-world relationship that the emerging church assumes. Absolutely nothing. If they have, I'd like to see it in print. I can issue an apology. I can say, hey, we're all moving on the same page now. You accept the pillars. Hey, we're moving in the right direction. And I can only hope and pray that that's happening. Okay. Um, again, calling on Jesus with no Bible study from the perspective of the formative role of the pillars is going to fail. If we just say, hey, let's put our differences aside and let's pray, let's not think about the pillars, let's not try to work with them, let's not try to analyze them, let's not try to see how they work, it's not going to work. It isn't going to work. That's in my humble opinion. And uh, you can see this being played out at the youth at the youth at the youth level. You got GYC on the one hand and the one, and the one project on the other. And if you read articles from Spectrum, hey, there's room in the church for both. That's a completely panentheistic emerging church idea that both can coexist at the same time because they're, they're part of the evolutionary process of becoming the one church. That's why we can have GYC and the one project at the same time. It's not a problem for Spectrum. Not a problem at all because we're functioning from completely different pillars. All right, what shall we do? If, if we remain the way we are, I think we're going to be gobbled up by this. It's, uh, uh, we're going to be gobbled up by it if we, if, if we allow things to remain the way they are. So let's critically assess what is taking place, and basically, let's get, let's get back to what, what formulated us as a church in the first place. The sola tota prima scriptura principles, which led to the biblical pillars, which led to a complete system of theology and philosophy, which then led to ministerial education and missionary paradigms, which then led to an organization for biblical ecumenism. 